BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. You're listening to Don't Tell Me The Score with me, Simon Mundy, where every week I sit down to discuss a sporting theme that's also relevant to life. And it is a bit of a different episode and guest this week as I'm speaking to the UK's chief rabbi. He listens to the show and his team got in touch with us to see if he could appear on Don't Tell Me The Score. Why? Well, let me read the email they sent to shed some light on it. It reads, the phrase Don't Tell Me The Score is particularly relevant to Jewish communities in the UK. With the biggest matches falling on a Saturday, Jews that keep Shabbat, meaning they switch off all technology for 25 hours from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, have to avoid finding out the football score at all costs until match of the day comes on. This can be a real challenge, so they find themselves saying the phrase, don't tell me the score on a weekly basis. Now, we weren't aware that don't tell me the score is such a common phrase amongst Jewish communities. And on top of the fact that the chief rabbi is a huge sports fan who really knows his stuff, there was no way we could decline their offer. So that's the basis for this special episode of Don't Tell Me The Score. And the theme of our chat is sacrifice in sport and in life. Here is the chief rabbi. Great to be with you, Simon. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, this podcast is called Don't Tell Me The Score. I was unaware of the significance of that saying to the Jewish people. Yeah, I mean, we hear such a phrase just about every Saturday. Observant Jews would not go to a football match, uh, would not watch anything on television on the day, and would very much like to see it straight after the Shabbat, which is our Sabbath. And many people say, don't tell me the score. An extraordinary example of don't tell me the score. <laughs> uh, Prince William. So I had the privilege of accompanying him on the very first royal visit to Israel, uh, which took place towards the end of June of 2018. So Prince William first had been in Jordan, and I met up with him on Monday the 25th of June. The previous day was England versus Panama in the World Cup. So William said to me uh, when we were chatting, he said, you know, yesterday I had a really difficult time. I told my hosts in Jordan, because I had a very important um, event to be at, I said to them, England are playing Panama now. Please don't tell me the score. And this evening, Prince Hassan, uh, the Crown Prince has invited me to watch the game, the two of us together. And I said to him, Your Royal Highness, you've had a Shabbat moment. Because <laughs> that's what we go through every single week. Uh, but then William added and he said, actually, many people told him the score. <laughs> and that spots it for him. Fantastic. And what I found out in the course of my research is what a fan of sport you are. Absolutely. I love all sports. When I was at school growing up in South Africa, I represented my school in rugby football, cricket, chess, and table tennis. Really? That yeah. is, that's, quite a, that's quite a sporting CV. May I ask what position you were in rugby? Rugby, I played centre, but when I was 15 years old, I tackled somebody, broke my left arm, it was in plaster for three months, and that was the end of my rugby career. I played rugby up until sort of I was 17, 18, and I, I still have dreams about it. That I think it, you know, <laughs> it, it, it obviously ended very physically for you, but it, it's such a physical sport. It's oh, absolutely. And, and when you're passionate about it, you live it, you breathe it. It, it, it is tremendous to be part of it. And then in terms of supporting countries, I grew up in South Africa until the age of 17, um, went to study in Israel, um, but then was the chief rabbi of Ireland, and our children grew up in Ireland, so their national team is Ireland. And now in England, obviously, we're supporting England. I can understand that. My father is Scottish. My mother is English, so I support more than one team as well. Um, I know as well you speak about the try in rugby. If you have a look at the historical background to the try, it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, it all started in 1845, where the way to score in the new game of rugby was uh, to score a goal by kicking the ball over the post. Um, and the way in which you were entitled to try to do that was by succeeding in placing the ball over the line. So therefore, by achieving what we call a try, that gave you the chance to try for goal. Hence, it was called a try. And then it was only in 1886 that it was realized that, gosh, some people, after all that effort, 
uh, missed the kick. And surely we should reward people for their effort. So therefore, from 1886 onwards, you got two points for kicking the goal mm. and one point for getting the ball over the line, which is what we call the try. And then it changed all the time through which I suppose you could differentiate between the journey and the destination. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the journey eventually became more important than the destination. And in 1992, uh, we were introduced to the current system of five points for a try and two for a conversion. Uh, and for me, there are two huge messages emerging out of this. First of all, um, it's important not only uh, to consider where we're going to, but also how we're going to get there. And often to engage in that journey is something really important. I think particularly today, when in so many realms of human endeavor, you can gain instant satisfaction, we're losing touch with the capacity to look forward to something, to build up expectation. Mm -hmm. to appreciate it because it is hard won. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the best example of this is our Shabbat. It's our Sabbath day. Hebrew, I believe, is the only language in the world in which the days of the week don't have an identity of their own. Sunday in Hebrew is Yom Rishon, which means first day. Monday is Yom Sheni, second day. Friday is sixth day, Yom Shishi, meaning that your journey through the week is one which always has the Shabbat in mind. So we're making the most of every opportunity, but also we're looking forward to something special. And that's the journey leading on to the, the destination. I think then there is a further, totally different application, which I thought of, and that's often in rugby, you get a choice um, when it comes to a penalty. If it's within kickable range, you can either kick for what should be a, a definite three points, or you can run with the ball, and that's a calculated risk, because you could end up with five or seven points, or you could end up with zero, or even worse, your opponents on the counter-offensive could go and score. And that's often what life is like, I suppose, in the world of saving and finance. You know, you can be a very cautious investor, and you'll get your three points. On the other hand, you could sometimes try for, for something highly ambitious, high risk, high dividend, uh, and you might regret it. It could make you into a millionaire. It could ruin you. Um, and then as well, when it comes to certain opportunities, I think it's good to go for the calculated risk uh, because otherwise we're never really going to achieve anything. So I think we need to have a blend of the kicking for the definite points and also trying to achieve something extraordinary. And how do you think you make that decision? Is this an instinct thing? Because... Like you say, there are sometimes we have to be a little more cautious and sometimes we have to be a bit more brave. I think that there are two things. First of all, it is instinct and preparation and knowledge and calculation. It's always best to make impromptu decisions which are based on fixed ideas so that you're not really facing this for the very first time. The second thing I would say, which is very important, you don't have to make the decision yourself. Always seek advice. Take the counsel of others. In whatever position you are in, take benefit from those who can advise you. Um, and certainly in the world of sport, you know, you'll get a lot of advice, particularly online now. Everybody's a manager. Everybody's the owner of the team. You'll hear from the whole world. Uh, so, uh, it's, But it's, it's good to have your ear to the ground to kind of hear what people are saying. You mentioned social media there and how everyone has an opinion. And I saw a fabulous clip where you were talking about um, a rabbi of the 19th century. And I won't do it justice, so over to you. <laughs> yeah, it was Rabbi Yisrael Salanta who lived from 1810 to 1883. I'm a great fan of his teachings and his writings. Uh, and he said, not everything I think needs to be said. Not everything I say needs to be written. Not everything I write needs to be published. Uh, and what's happening today is we're going from the thought process to the publishing process within an instant. You think something, you press a button, mm. and then the whole world, here's what you have to say. Uh, and sometimes you regret what you do. There's a further brilliant Jewish teaching from centuries ago, which is so relevant today, where a man came to his rabbi and he said, Rabbi, you know, I'm guilty of slander. I've been unnecessarily and harmfully giving a bad name to others. Please can you tell me how can I repent? And the rabbi said, oh, it's simple. On a windy day, fill up a box full of feathers, go to the top of a hill, open the box, allow all the feathers to blow out, wait for one hour, 
and then go and pick up all the feathers and put them back in the box. And the man said, Rabbi, that's impossible. And the rabbi said, that's my answer. Because, you know, once the words are out of your mouth, you can't bring them back in again. Mm. And particularly today, where the impact is global and long-lasting, you can't undo the damage you've done. So we really need to think carefully before we press that button. Yeah, you mentioned not planning ahead and, and we're in an era of quick gratification. Is it significantly more like that than at any time you can remember? Definitely. Oh, yeah. And and the mindset of our society is one in which we expect instant service Yeah. in whatever area of human functioning it is. You know, I grew up um, through no choice, having to be patient. You know, if you've ordered a telephone, you'll wait for your three months for it or whatever the appliance was or, or whatever it was in life. As a result, one tended to appreciate things more because it wasn't easy to trade them in um, and you would take greater care. Um, So uh, while on the other hand today, isn't it wonderful that we can receive pleasure in so many ways uh, very quickly? And that does tie in well with sacrifice, doesn't it? Because people expect things so quickly yeah. and uh, we are, as we said, in the era of instant gratification. Yeah. So the idea of sacrificing time or sacrificing finance or sacrificing anything for that longer goal is quite alien to a lot of people. Yeah, and, and in our Jewish tradition, we see sacrifice as a positive. I think that the term in English certainly has a negative connotation. In Hebrew, the word for sacrifice is korban, which literally means to come close to. So the purpose of the sacrifice is to actually embrace a notion, to come close to a person or a concept, to do something amazing. Now, en route to doing that, in order to make that omelette, you might have to crack some eggs. And, and the sacrifice is the cracking of the eggs, which is part of the process to lead you to something brilliant. Yeah. Um, so for us, sacrifice is a really positive thing. And bringing it back quickly to sports. And people obviously see these, these sports stars who uh, they idolise. What they don't see and what often doesn't get reflected on is the level of sacrifice that, that has to go into it. Oh, absolutely. No pain, no gain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, it's what you put in, that's what you're going to get out. Yeah. And if it, I can just cite an example uh, from somebody who was Samuel Ryshevsky. Uh He died in 1992. He was seven times over the American chess champion. He even beat Bobby Fischer. Right. But... Probably people listening to this right now have never heard of him, and that's because he never played on the Shabbat, on the Jewish Sabbath. Is that right? Because his religion came before his chess. Wow. And that's real sacrifice. But for him, he had Shabbat. And uh, let me share with you a a personal experience I, I had in that regard. It was the 30th of June, 1990. So at that time... um I was chief rabbi of Ireland and uh, with my wife raising our five children. Why was that date special? I think on that date, Ireland achieved something in sport it hadn't achieved before and probably never since then. It was World Cup in Italy. Ireland extraordinarily reached the finals of the World Cup and then against all odds came to the quarterfinals just three matches away from lifting that cup Ireland versus Italy, and it was on a Saturday afternoon. So the entire nation of the Republic of Ireland, together with all cats and dogs, whoever, whatever, everybody was watching that, either in the stadium or on TV live, except for observant Jews. For us, it was our Shabbat. So uh, within our household, we were looking forward to the end of Shabbat when we would, uh, you know, be able, to, you know, we were telling people, don't tell us the score, we want to see it from scratch. In the course of my research, I became more familiar and more aware of the importance of Shabbat. Yeah. And it's described as an oasis of calm. I saw it described as an oasis of calm in this frantic world yeah. in which we live. Yeah. And, um, and I spoke to a, a friend of mine who observes it and it really did give me a clearer picture of the importance of it and the customs of it. And so there will be people listening who aren't as familiar with yeah. with what the day or what, the, what it all looks like. So let, let, can we paint the picture? <laughs> it's one day in a week in which we devote ourselves to family, to community, to bonding with people, to spirituality, to everything that's important in our lives. 
And then it's a digital detox day because we can't be creative. And creative includes just flicking a switch because I'm creating an electric current and therefore the light goes on, which wasn't there before. And it enables us to take a step back and to kind of think, who's really in charge of the world? And what is our position? Um, and what is really important? And the result, therefore, is that it's a day through which we recharge our batteries, both spiritual and physical, uh, and it enables us to engage with our roots, with our people, to bond with people. The community dimension of Shabbat is something really very special. And what I'm finding today at a time when people are being governed by and ruled by the digital and electric world, they appreciate this day which is set aside. And in fact, so many people are now calling for everybody in our society to nominate a digital detox day just like the Jews have on the Shabbat. Yeah, that does seem incredibly important because of the degree to which people are dependent on digital. And yeah. we don't know what the effect of that will be because everyone is a guinea pig. There are no older generations who've been through it. We're That's all right. doing it at once. Yeah. So the idea of having that time where yeah. you don't even have to think about, oh, I'm not going to do it. Just, that's just the way it is. And the brilliant thing about Shabbat is I know that the phone won't go. On the average Shabbat, I know the phone won't go. I know I won't be disturbed. The tranquility that is in the air is something absolutely extraordinary. You mentioned community. Yeah. And obviously this is uh, crucial to Shabbat, but also the Jewish faith. And there is a sense that I got, it's more we than I. And I think this relates to sacrifice as well. And, and as the sacrifice, one of the sacrifices in sport, because we can put some of the sacrifices on one side. Yeah. That would be physical. Think of Andy Murray's hip. He's essentially sacrificed yeah. his hip for the, for the, for the yeah. greater good of his game. Yeah. Time, obviously, you know, all these kind of things. Yeah. But then there is the self-sacrifice, which is such a positive aspect of sport, self-sacrifice for the team. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea of, of putting others before yourself I, what, what strikes me about that is the meaning that comes with that. Because we obviously talk about meaning. It, it's spoken often about as, as the key almost to well-being yeah. and thinking of others. I think you've got an exact comparison with many team sports. So if you take, for example, a batsman who's going out to the crease, okay, he's scoring runs for himself and he's scoring runs for his team. At one of the same moment, he's batting for himself and he's batting for England, right? People, the commentators will say, England is out at the crease, right? <laughs> But it's just this one single person. And so, too, it's the power of community. I am myself. And at the same time, I need to show that I'm an integral part of my community. Uh, and what I'm here for is for the sake of everybody. It gives one a wonderful identity. And it also enables people to know that they are welcome and appreciated as people. I think here there is another great need with in our age of I, the IT revolution, at a time when people can boast many hundreds of Facebook friends and they can still feel very much alone, it's a time when all the more we appreciate the power of community, real friends, real people. And I think the test of community is it's a place where if you don't pitch up, you'll get a call to ask where were you? Are you all right? Whenever I think of the power of community, I always think back to London 2012, which was a beautiful time yeah, in this country. There was obviously concerns about, you know, was it going to be a success? And then we had this period, didn't we, where the whole country sort of came together and there was that sense of community. Yeah. And there, there is nothing quite like it, that I, of connecting with others. Yeah. It, that is, it's the, the basis, I think, for, for well-being. Yeah, and there's community at so many different levels. Take, for example, the Ryder Cup, uh. kind of, we're all Europe, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Just think how far it spreads. Uh, and ultimately, we need to be, we're part of the world. Let me give you an example about community, which um, we as a family discovered when we moved into our new home. And uh, we decided that the very first reception we would hold would be for all the residents of our street. So we invited on a Sunday afternoon all 34 households. We had men, women, and their children coming along. It was a brilliant event. The whole purpose from our point of view was to introduce ourselves to our neighbors, but actually it had a far greater impact. It turned out to have a far greater purpose, and that was giving them a chance to get to know each other. Many had lived on the street for decades and yet did not know 
the others on the street. You would usually tend to know the people to your right and to your left, but two to your right and two to your left, you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Go out of your house, into your car, and off you go to wherever you're going. We've lost that sense of community in our neighbourhoods. Yeah, the suspicion of the other, and we see it in sport. We yeah. see it, for example, in football. Now, <laughs> taking football as an example, we have on the one side this a very powerful sense of community. You're a Tottenham fan, yeah. so you're very aware of that. And then yet as well, um, in football, there is that distrust of the other or dislike of the other. And there's, a, in part, a playful element to that yeah. in, in football, but there's also a, a, a negative part to that. Unfortunately, some people don't only define their identity according to what they are, they also define it according to what they are not. And I believe that that's a weakness in character. The example that I give in our communities is uh, an example from the world of cricket. I preach we should all be like batsmen and not like bowlers. We need to be proud of our own identity, to go out there, score runs, fours and sixes for the team that we're part of and that we represent. And at the same time, we shouldn't try to bowl others out. We need to respect others. And let's be happy when they rejoice. So this kind of Spurs, Arsenal or City United or Liverpool, Everton kind of unhealthy hatred, that's really what yeah, it comes down yeah. to. Uh, that shouldn't be part of, of our sporting world. No. And we know that obviously the, the, the racist element of it gets much more yeah. called out now. But even beyond that, there is just, just, I don't want to say, but basic abuse. And that seems yeah. to be tolerated to some degree. It's a huge shame that that is the case. We can easily get so much out of sport without going down to that level. It's a pity when I see adults covering the ears of children at sports fixtures mm. so that they shouldn't hear the chance. And uh, I'm proud, for example, of what Chelsea Football Club did. I was uh, in January uh, at Stamford Bridge for the launch of their uh, program uh, against anti-Semitism. And... I applaud them because by launching such a program, they were acknowledging that they have a problem. I think it's a strength to acknowledge when a problem exists. It needs to be tackled. And they've got a wide-ranging program for people at all levels who are associated with the club. And I wish that other clubs would emulate what they have done. Just to bring it back to, to sacrifice, perhaps from an individual, personal level. Yeah. Now, if I think of even a small sacrifice that I made in my career, when I realised I wanted to get into radio, every Saturday I worked for free for a year. And at the time, I obviously didn't get to see my friends. I didn't get to watch sport. And now I'm really sort of pleased I did that. And we've spoken about how people are not great, I don't want to generalise too much, at deferring sort of that gratification. Yeah. How important, or if you were to um, explain to people listening who perhaps recognise this as a weakness in themselves, how important is that idea of, of sacrificing things that you enjoy for that greater goal? Yeah, it is important. I myself would not use the term sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I'd use the term investment. That is a nice word, isn't it? It's a positive word, right? So you're not punishing the person by saying, I recommend you stay in your room and you swat up for that exam because if you get that degree, that'll open doors to you for the rest of your life. Uh, as opposed to, you mustn't go out and you must give up on whatever the pleasures might be. I think we need to encourage people positively uh, and to empower them to appreciate how important investment is, investment of time, talent, money, uh, and so on. And then, I mean, it, it's a no-brainer. Anybody who's succeeded in this world will tell you it's only happened because they've invested in it. Martin Keown, I saw him uh, asked yeah. about sacrifice, and he said, it wasn't a sacrifice. I love doing what I'm, what I'm doing. Fantastic. So taking that positive view yeah. of this is an investment, actually, that then, of course, it's easier to do it because you're looking at it in a different way. Absolutely, and it brings us back to the journey and the destination. A journey is not necessarily an easy path to take. Mm. There can be many obstacles in the path, but you need to engage with it. And, and it's important, you know, you use the word enjoying. Yeah, we need to enjoy what we're doing, not only while grappling with the action at hand, but also the sense of achievement 
when you're dreaming of what will come about as a result of your investment, it's part of that brilliant journey. And there is a different feeling when you do sacrifice time and effort and eventually get somewhere because of that. Yeah, absolutely. And also, there is no investment which uh, is a waste of time or effort. Because even though you might not get the job that you were going for (laughs) or what, what you were dreaming about doesn't happen, what you did will prove to deliver benefits of unexpected kinds uh, in your future. You've spoken about your own sacrifice, looking back to uh, Italia 90, or rather your own investment. (laughs) Let me put that correctly. Are there any examples of sacrifice in sport that that sort of strike you? In the course of doing this podcast, I'll just let you think, and while I uh, just reflect briefly, in the course of doing this podcast, I spoke uh, about character with a man who had written a book called The Captain Class all about the key ingredients of all the the, the best teams of all time. And the, the, the key ingredient turned out to be a captain who did not seek the limelight, who um, was happy to be kind of that water carrier figure yeah. who would uh, operate in the background, not seek uh, aggrandizement of, of, any, of any kind. And there yeah. was one man who I'd never actually previously heard of called Tim Duncan, and he, he stayed at uh, the San Antonio Spurs for the, his whole career, had very little interest in, in overly engaging with the media. They said when he, when he retired, the culture went with him. And I'd never heard of this guy, but he made a huge impression on me just yeah. reading about it. Is there any examples of, of sacrifice in sport that really strike you? Speaking personally, I, and, and again, I'd prefer to use the term investment sure. behind the scenes. So um, our daughter, Leora, was a star chess player. Um, and she was uh, a member of the team which won the All-Ireland Under-12 Chess Championships. Uh, it sounds impressive, and it was impressive. How did she do that? It's all thanks to April Cronin. So April Cronin was the women's chess champion of Ireland who happened to be a teacher at the Jewish Primary School in Dublin, and she used her talent behind the scenes to coach the kids. So whereas certain names were up in neon lights, it's the coach behind the scenes who was really responsible for it all. And I think that, um, you know, people say behind every great son, so mm. there is whoever. That is very true. Uh, and everybody is important. Um, it's like uh, the president of America who, who visited the headquarters of NASA and saw somebody sweeping the floor and he said, what's your job? And he said, I'm sending a man to the moon. Whatever your role, you're part of delivering. Uh, and everybody's important in that endeavor. The groundsmen, the people who prepared the pitch, they are as important as the players who play upon it. Some their names are in print, others are not, but everybody's part of that endeavor. And when you are part of that culture, you get a huge amount mm. of enrichment in life and fulfillment. I have to ask you about, about yeah. Tottenham quickly. Yeah. Mauricio Pochettino. Yeah. What a revelation that man has been. I remember when he came here, people were like, who is this guy? Doesn't speak English, blah, blah, blah. And yet now, what, I mean, what, what, a, what standing he has. Absolutely. I think he has taught us and reminded us of the fact that it's the person and not the fame, not the name. Mm. You get renowned managers who come into teams and they can mess things up for those teams. <laughs> there are some obvious examples of that. And then you can get some relatively unknown people who just work wonders mm. because of the way they engage with their players, encourage them, inspire them, understand them, being, you know, a tactical genius. Uh, He is a lovely person. I've met him, Mm. and and he's a really nice guy, uh, and he's an inspiration. Mm. You talk about engaging and inspiring in in the case of Mauricio Pochettino, and I think of of this new breed, him, uh, Pep Guardiola, Jurgen Klopp, and there is that sense of they've got an ability, an emotional intelligence of being able to put their arms around people yeah. and bring them into them. And there is that again; it's that kind of that that self sacrifice for 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 a community. And that, yeah. that is, I think it's encouraging that we've got people like this now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Spurs are now third in the league, and when I see Liverpool winning, part of me kind of is happy. I, I see Klopp and the way that he conducts himself. Yeah. His style in interviews, I think it's pretty impressive. And you have to admire that mm. and to applaud their achievements. Let's just uh, look to, to wrap things up. To, to sum up the importance of 
sacrifice slash investment in the Jewish faith, in sport and in life? You know, what, what, would, what would you say about that? Crucial. Anybody who has ever been successful is a person who has invested wisely and who has applied himself or herself in a really tough way. And even people who are lucky enough to receive a legacy, to kind of walk into something that's ready-made, they will only make a good go of it if they're applying themselves and invest wisely. Um, nobody's ever regretted it, no. even though it can be tough. And, and doing that investment, the, the, the reward at the end of it, the feeling that one gets, it, it does have a different quality. Oh, absolutely. We, we've got a verse in the Psalms, you know, uh, when you eat the fruits of your labors, happy are you and it's good for you. So the, the path to happiness is when you eat the fruits of your labors. You have to apply that hard graft. And then when the dividends and the benefits come, there's no happiness quite like it. Thanks very much for listening to this special episode of Don't Tell Me The Score with the Chief Rabbi. Please do subscribe to the show on BBC Sounds if you haven't done already. Get in touch on social media. We do respond to every single message and we will be back next time. Until then, goodbye. Did you know that technology can make us kinder to one another? Did you hear about the diver who walked out of the sea onto a Portuguese beach dragging the internet behind him? Did you realize that how you speak to the little robot helper in your house might cement age-old stereotypes for decades to come? I'm Alex Kratoski, and those are just some of the stories that we've looked at in The Digital Human, the podcast that explores what it means to be human in the digital age. If you want to hear more, and I guarantee we will surprise you, come check us out exclusively on BBC Sounds.